Salam everybody. I hope you are all fine. This is lecture 10 of our semester 2 syllabus in uh, contemporary US political thought and foreign policy. The lecture is titled The Domino Theory and US Global Interventionism. In this lecture, we shall see together how the domino theory led successive American administrations to follow a policy of military intervention at a global scale. The purpose of that policy was to prevent the fall of what was called dominoes to communism. The lecture is divided into two parts. In part one, I shall introduce, identify, and define the key terminology, most notably domino theory and domino effect, and also provide a general background and overview of the two cases we'll be looking into in this lecture, namely the Korean War and the Vietnam War. In part two, I shall assess and appraise the domino theory and how it governed U.S. foreign policy throughout the Cold War era. Let's start by defining some key terms here. And one of them is, is of course, domino theory or domino effect. Now, this uh, domino theory first began as a mindset largely present within the decision-making institutions of the United States from roughly the early 1950s onwards. Now, this mindset gradually developed into a foreign policy theory which would guide American decision-makers until roughly the late 1980s and early 1990s. In simple terms, it conceded that countries which did not benefit from American protection would fall to external communist maneuvering one by one like a row of dominoes. Now, the precepts of this confrontational theory gradually became omnipresent within the U.S. decision-making spheres. One persistent feature of the precepts of this theory was the centrality of the global communist threat. And as we shall see a little bit later, the domino theory was used by successive American administrations to justify military intervention across the world. U.S. foreign policy would thus find itself antagonizing nationalist aspirations for freedom and supporting colonialist powers and backing authoritarian regimes in different parts of the world. Now, President Eisenhower was the first to convert that mindset into words and to use the term domino. This happened in April 1954 in the context of what was seen by Washington as mounting communist threat from North Vietnam to its neighbors. And here I'm quoting Eisenhower. You have broader considerations that might follow what you would call the falling domino principle. You have a row of dominoes set up. You knock over the first one, and what will happen to the last one is the certainty that it will go over very quickly. So you could have a beginning of a disintegration that would have the most profound influences." Unquote. And those profound influences, as he called them, would be quite simply to see into China, Burma, Thailand, the Korean Peninsula, Indonesia, turn communist, and perhaps even Japan, Australia, and India. Now, the precepts of the domino theory were actually interconnected with the theses of containment and, NSC, and NSC 68, which we saw earlier. You recall, NSC 68 had warned that, quote, the defeat of free institutions anywhere is a defeat everywhere, 
Unquote. And this is precisely the key premise the domino theory was to be anchored on. You recall also that NSC 68 urged U.S. policymakers to accept, quote, the responsibility of world leadership, unquote. In the same vein, the essence of the domino theory was the United States' obligation to help, quote, unquote, vulnerable countries against external communist threats. The domino effect was repeatedly cited by American policymakers to justify American foreign interventions during the Cold War era. By the early 1950s, the cockpit of Cold War tension was shifting to Southeast Asia. China, as you know, had already turned communist, and the communist threat was starting to be felt in the Korean Peninsula and also in Indochina. Ahead of this lecture, I provided you with some historical background and overview of the wars in Korea and Vietnam. This is to help you better grasp the analytical content of this lecture. So let's start with the Korean War. Korea, as you know, had remained under Japanese occupation from 1910 until Japan's defeat in World War II. With the end of the war, the two Koreas were to be separated by the 38th parallel. And the 38th parallel is what you can see here on the, on the map. You can actually see it, uh, see it here on the map. On the 25th of June 1950, North Korean troops crossed that dividing line, which was the 38th parallel. The purpose was to reunify the two Koreas by military force. General Douglas MacArthur, who was appointed commander-in-chief of the American-led UN forces in Korea, wanted to conquer as much territory as possible inside North Korea in, uh, in his counterattack. Now, the counterattack took place in September 1950, and in that counterattack, the UN forces, which were actually represented by 90% of American soldiers, managed to push the North Korean troops back across the 38th parallel. Sensing the danger of its, for its security, China decided to enter the war on the side of North Korea. And it was able by mid-1951 to push back General MacArthur's troops inside South Korea. Contrary to MacArthur's request to use the atomic device, against North Korea and its ally China, Truman and his advisers remained determined to keep the war quote-unquote limited. This is to avoid giving the Soviet Union the pretext to intervene directly in the fighting. So what was feared by those advisers? Actually, they feared that any direct Soviet involvement would entangle the United States in a long war in Asia in which victory couldn't be guaranteed. For Truman's advisers, American resources were badly needed in Europe, which, after all, should remain Washington's prized possession par excellence. The war officially drew to an end with the signing of the Armistice Agreement on the, on the 23rd of July 1953. You can see on the map here the 38th parallel which was officially re-established as the dividing line between the two Koreas. And also on the picture you can see how the 38th parallel looked like in the early 1950s. A large portion of American public opinion considered the war totally unnecessary. And quite ironically, that seemed also to be the view of American officials at the end of the war. General Bradley, the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the time, actually summed up that state of mind. He admitted before the Senate that 
it was, quote, the wrong war of the wrong place of the wrong time. After huge human losses estimated at 5 million deaths and colossal material devastation, the status quo ante was restored. North Korea was to remain under communist rule and pro-Western, and South Korea was to remain capitalist and pro-Western. Let's now see what the Vietnam War was all about, and how the U.S. intervention in that war unfolded. One of the things we should keep in mind is that the miscalculations, the misperceptions and missteps which had characterized American involvement in Korea were to be repeated in Vietnam, by and large. As you know, Vietnam had been under French occupation until World War II, when it was lost to Japan. With Japan's defeat at the end of the war, the Vietnamese nationalists took up arms to counter French plans to re-establish the colonial order in their country. They were actually supported by China and the Soviet Union. As expected, France's loss of control over Vietnam became a source of serious concern and serious worry in Washington. In 1959, the Viet Minh, with the support of of the Viet Cong, which was a South Vietnamese guerrilla movement, launched a military operation to unite, to unify the two parts of Vietnam under their rule. The administrations of Eisenhower, Kennedy and Johnson all cited the domino theory to justify their military and financial commitment to the defense of South Korea. And ultimately, to justify the decision to deploy American troops on the ground in Vietnam. By 1968, actually, the number of U.S. troops deployed on the ground had reached 536,000 soldiers. But despite its vast military superiority, the American army was incapable of defeating the Viet Minh and their allies in South Vietnam. To avoid sinking deeper into the Vietnamese quagmire, and in order to cut the cost of an assured defeat, the Nixon administration went all lengths to bring the Viet Minh to the negotiating table. A ceasefire agreement was signed by the two sides in 1973. This actually opened the way to North Vietnam to take over control of the whole of South Vietnam after the humiliating withdrawal of the United States from Saigon in 1975. So this is what we can briefly say in this part about the domino theory and how uh, it impacted American interventionism in, and American policy of intervention in both the Vietnam War and the Korean War and how that intervention unfolded for the United States. In part two, we shall see how the domino theory was used by the US political establishment, establishment to justify military intervention in foreign countries, starting with Southeast Asia. And we shall see whether that theory was a success or a failure when it comes to, to US foreign policy. That's it. I hope you stay safe.